We're good. We're good? Okay. So, hello cyber professionals. So, welcome to B-Size 2019. And I want to introduce Mr. Paul. He's a pioneer in uh, network security engineer. He's been working for more than 30 years and currently he's been working as a senior network engineer in Broadway Bank. So please welcome Mr. Paul. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I feel like a dinosaur in computing, so I'm kind of showing off dinosaur type technology here today. Um, you might have to zoom in the camera down the road when we kind of show off the interface, but let me talk about it first. Um, Digital Equipment Corporation made computers um, starting in the 1960s. Uh, like most computer companies, the engineers kind of, uh, some of them didn't see eye to eye with management. They broke off and made their own computer company called Data General. And it, there was always this kind of like uh, unofficial like rivalry between Data General and, uh, and, and DEC, Computer Digital Equipment Corporation. It was really funny, the DG guys were nuts. And, and the data and the deck guys were quite prim and proper, not quite IBM prim and proper, but pretty prim and proper. And, and the, what caused the rift between the two engineer groups was they didn't want to go to a um, uh, hex system for the computer. Data General did. They wanted to change the, 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 the base that the computer ran on. So that was like the big uh, engineering rift in the 1960s between those particular computing companies. So the PDP 1170 was originally uh, introduced in, in 1975. It is uh, a 16-bit word size, 22-bit uh, physical address size, and virtual address size of 16 bits. Yeah, it could directly address only four megabytes of memory. That's it. So if you needed something, <laughs> this gentleman in sitting up in the front here is nodding his head because he actually was a, a were you an operator, sir? Okay, so am I right about the data general versus deck thing? Uh, and by the way, I knew some data general guys, and, and they were rarely sober. I'm just letting you know. And look at the deck guy laughing. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, these buses are pre uh, forerunners. The Unibus, Mass Bus, memory, and the memory bus was uh, an innovative thing for the 1170, or the, actually the uh, the PDP 11. Prior to this. Computers were custom built, and there were no way to expand the buses of those computers for the most part. They tried to make a plug-in type arrangement where you could plug in a paper tape reader or paper tape writer. Yeah, they used to literally write ones and zeros on strips of paper and then would feed that back through, and that could contain the operating system. Um, have you ever had a core dump that you've done? Have uh, you ever seen that? Why did they call it a core dump? Because these things ran on core memory, tiny little donuts of magnetic material with wires running through them in a grid arrangement that were stacked in layers. And that magnetic memory, that magnetic uh, pulse would stay in it. So they could turn it off, like a USB drive would remember what you had. Core memory will keep that magnetic material in that one and zero. Now, it was destructive, right? It's Schrodinger's cat of mag magnetic uh, technology, right? Is it there or is it not there? Let's check. Oh, I just killed it. Um, so, it was it a one or a zero? So, you could turn that thing back on. So, you could actually turn the PDP-11 off, turn it back on, and it would remember the operating system that it had running on it and, and exactly the state it was at at the time. Um, so, that was a, an advantage of core memory. Um, which is different than uh, the other memory technologies that were available and, and weren't available at the time. Um, so, yeah, so a core dump really that we talk about today was literally talking about tiny little donuts with wires running through them. That's core memory. <laughs> um, if you've ever seen it, it's absolutely the most beautiful w work of art um, uh, for electronics. It looks like a tiny little carpet because of the way it's weaved together. As a matter of fact, they, they had a special teams of women, for the most part, that could see and manipulate the, those tiny little wires through those tiny little cores to make those things so exacting right every single time. Just a, unbelievable uh, dedication and skill to be able to build those memory cores. And that's exactly the same kind of memory cores that were used on the Apollo missions and stuff. It's just, I don't know. Crazy. Notable achievements of the PDP-11. 
So a number of operating systems were designed uh, for the PDP-11. Uh, this, this replica of the PDP-11 runs 10 different operating systems out of the box. Uh, there's a, uh, a set of downloads you can do for it, and you can run uh, multiple multi-user and single-user type operating systems, including Unix 2.11. Um, there is a video I saw recently where they were talking about Unix 2.11 versus, versus modern Unix, and they were talking about all the interdependencies of libraries of an individual uh, program. When you do an LS, right, and you're doing a, just a list, you know how many dependencies that causes, how many libraries that actually calls? Back then, it was literally a, 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 like 12 lines of code. That's it. it it's really short. And it, you can go on and on and on and look at that to try and see the historic differences. But not to be, uh, well, I think I got that in a little bit later slide. So <clears throat> both C programming, uh, Unix, all first ran on the PDP-11. As a matter of fact, C was like custom made to take advantages of the processor that was built into the PDP-11. Over 600,000 PDP-11s were sold. In 1995, I'm at a Shell uh, uh, oil and gas uh, manu uh, um, exploration uh, department that was down in the South Texas coast. I was doing some work on their Novell servers, yeah, another set of dinosaurs that don't exist, um, and I looked over in the room and there's a, two racks, and one of them has a PDP-11 in it, and next to it was the rack that had the disk packs in it, so think about round platters, about the size of, I'd say records, but that's even old technology now too, right, records, 12 inch, I don't know, big disks, four or five stacks of disks, and they'd take these disks and put them in the, the, di the machine and pray to God they didn't get any dust on them so they wouldn't scratch them because that would take the media right off of them, and then it would run the disk. Those were five megabytes, uh, those disks. Um, what this particular computer did was absolutely pedestrian, right? Uh, systems out there would call into it via a phone modem back in 95 and say, my tank is full, and they'd send a truck over there, and they'd empty the tank. <laughs> Pretty straightforward stuff, uh, but that's kind of what it was used for. It was just a workaholic. It would just sit there and crunch out this stuff, and they were like, you know, we could replace this thing, but it's running, you know, and, and it's not like the code is hard either. It's pretty straightforward code that they had for the, the modems to be able to get all that to work. So these things were a just absolute workhorse. Um, I'm going to see if I can pop up a video here. Yeah, of course I trust this. It's not my laptop. Sorry, dude. No. Oh, uh, here. Chrome and... There, I got it. Yeah, so um, I don't know if this is going to have audio or not, but... Oh, it's not up. Oh, oh, it's not up there. One second. Let me swing it to the other pair. All that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, gotta grab the whole thing. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, and I missed it. <laughs> oh, okay. And oh, and wait, where's my? No, I did it again. Why is it? Oh, it's because I got to do it there. Oh, it's because it I'm in stop presentation the, mode. Stop the slideshow. Uh, that's what I got to do. Is, uh, go back to the slideshow, click, and escape. There we go. Yeah. And now, let's see if I can do that. And oh, okay. Let's do the old tap thing. There we go. So here's a gentleman that just released this video like six days ago, and it's so awesome. Um, I'll kind of talk through. Let me go ahead and grab the mic again here in a second. I'm going to start back at the beginning. So what this gentleman's doing is he's going to load, uh, what is it, uh, RT11 uh, as an operating system. So what you first have to start with is you go and you um, uh, go into the SIM program that's on here, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, and you tell it, don't boot an operating system, or don't even boot blinky lights. This is just a running program that says run blinky lights. And so he's going to go ahead. Did I stop it? I stopped it. 
No, it's running. Good. Okay. And um, so he's going to grab an address. And I think it's what, let's see which one he's going to get here. I uh, don't have audio, but it should be coming up pretty soon because he's, he's got to put in a lot of hex, com not hex, I'm sorry, octal commands. So you see this, this the way the switches are aligned? So he stops the operating system, and then he's going to start loading things. Um, there's like, down here, there's three of one color, and then three of another, and three of another, and three of another, and three of another. This computer is octal. So its base is zero through seven. That's it. There's no hex up to F. There's no binary. Well, you, there is binary underneath it all, but it's octal, zero through seven. So that's why the switches are arranged in threes in different colors. So he can go ahead and count across. So if he needs to put in a thousand, that means the the second set of red over, he's got to do a one, and then zero, zero, zero on the next sets of threes, and that would be a thousand uh, or, or the equivalent of one zero zero zero. Um, so, so he's flipping up different addresses, and then he's going to go ahead and flip the load switch and load that in there. And as he does that, it's going to sequence across the top which instruction he's putting in. When he's done, he's going to hit start. I'll go ahead and fast forward it. After he gets the operating system fully in, I'm going to kind of get it there. <clears throat> and then he's going to flip up the start button which is at the end and when he does it's going to go ahead and fire up that RT11 uh, operating system so he's looking and loading specific memory addresses in in the com uh, computer to make that happen and here comes start boom and now he's running uh, RT11 it's I, I was going to do this but you mess up one code switch while you're trying to do this in a live demo, and you know what's going to happen. It will fail every time. That's why I had glad this gentleman put up this wonderful video. Okay, enough of that. Go back here, and F5, and do 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 do, doom doom. Okay, all that is wonderful because of Sim H. Sim H. A guy named Robert Sputnik, uh, is a former deck engineer, started op uh, making this multi-operating system system. It also runs on Windows and other operating systems. This is running on a Raspberry Pi on the back of this interface. This is about 60% scale of the original face panel that was there. It can e emulate over 40 different operating systems. Um, and you've got a GitHub repository there. So if you wanted to emulate an Atari or you want to emulate an IBM whatever, System 3, if you happen to have old code from those things, this guy's program will run that natively. So there was this wonderful thing out there, right? You can run it like a PDP-11 or a PDP-1 or a PDP-11, uh, 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 a 10, all these different versions. That was really neat, but that was all in software, right? It's like running a VM. And like a VM, you don't have that physical connection to the computer, right? Um, back when I was running uh, old compact computers and stuff, you had a physical connection to that disk's array that you're building there, right? You had physical, you could touch it. Nowadays with VMs, yeah, uh, somebody asked, hey, where's that computer running that's, uh, you know, under PCI? And I go, it's here somewhere in this general area of racks you know because i can't tell where the vm moved to it, and it could remove and rebalance at any time and they were like what you know auditors <laughs> exactly right um the official site for simh is uh simh trailing at dash edge.com if y'all wanted to get that um plus if you want to uh the presentation and another presentation i have uh i've got pastebin.com uh, I'm, I'm, I'm radio teacher on, on uh, Twitter, uh, as it said at the very beginning. So if you go pastebin.com uh, slash you for user slash radio teacher, you'll see B-Sides uh, 2019, and there'll be direct links to these presentations there. So you can go get them. Um, so that's the crazy guy that makes the SIM program, right? This is the crazy guy that makes this interface. He first made uh, just a, a standard little computer interface that was uh, uh, like, like a little hex computer. I, I, I can't even describe it. 
Then he decided to ramp up his game, and he made this replica of a PDP-8. And once again, it tied back to the SIM program, so it was a physical representation where you actually could have switches that actually did something that controlled the VM on the inside, which was awesome. Stepped up his game one more, and he just came out with this back in uh, October of last year. Um, if you do any kind of security podcast, uh, one of the ones I would recommend highly, especially if you're just starting out, is called Security Now. It's got Steve Gibson in it. Steve uh, had built and written articles and everything for as long as I can remember. Uh, back in the 80s, I was reading his works in InfoWorld, and I was just enthralled because every time I would open up uh, InfoWorld, I would look for his articles. Now I listen to his two hour plus podcast every week just to try and keep up with what's going on. Omar's sitting there shaking his head. And not only is he uh, a very, he's a very patient teacher uh, and he, he talks about things in very technical terms but in easy to understand terms. Um, when this thing came out, he was like, gotta have one. Uh, and, and Oscar, the Swedish gentleman, he did the plastic injection molding, all of the switch information, uh, how to build this thing. There's like 64 LEDs in this thing um, that make it work. Um, and the switches have to go in in a very specific order. So they give you actually a, a template. Yeah, sorry about that. Moved a little bit on you. They give you a specific template on how to put these switches in. And it's really hard to get them perfectly straight. I did a pretty good job um, and stuff. But if I wanted to, like, once again, I could, I could flip the switches and stop it and start it. Let's see. Here's halt. And that stops it. And I could go ahead and start it again. Boom. And uh, stuff. So this is a physically controlling the VM that's running in memory on a Raspberry Pi on the inside. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful piece of technology. Um, it's only about a, uh, if you want to build one, I recommend it. Uh, I think it's $250. It, all in all, with shipping and everything, it's about $300 or so because of, uh, it's coming out of Sweden. No, Sweden? No, Switzerland. Switzerland. Uh, is where Oscar lives. So it came by, you know, Swiss Post. It was really kind of cool. I don't get too much things from Swiss Post. So, uh, uh, and he's a really nice guy. Uh, they, they do production runs on these things on occasionally. This isn't really a moneymaker for him. This is expensive to build all of this injection molding stuff and the circuit boards and everything else. Um, is it perfect? No, but it's pretty darn close. Now, somebody has stepped up Oscar's game with this piece of hardware. Um, there, there's something called a field programmable gate array. With that type of hardware, you can emulate things. You can actually go and program what a computer does. And so there are people out there that have got a field programmable gate array that can actually emulate a PDP-11. And then what they did is they actually interfaced it to this. So, it's got a real console cable port. It's got real manifestations of everything else. The trick was, how do you get that field programmable gate array to hook up to this guy? Because its voltages are different than the voltages that this thing was designed for. The trick was putting a 100 uh, ohm resistor across a couple of resistors that were there on the board. Done. They figured it out just literally last week. So there's an active forum going on for this device and his future devices that he's making. His next one, it's really stupid, but I don't know what the guys with DEC were thinking, but there was the PDP-1, and then the PDP-8, and then the PDP-10. Wait, no, the 11. The 10 came after the, the 11. Yeah. What, really, guys? And that one is a 36-bit computer. <laughs> yeah, just to keep you on your toes, right? Um, and it's a much bigger computer, too. It's physically, it was like a desk. And that's the next one that Oscar's building. He's designing the PDP-10 right now. Uh, I, I had a picture of the, the original. Look, he got the colors just right. And the way that this thing's laid out, uh, it's amazing. It's the same feel and everything. This is the PDP-11, uh, or PIDP-11 website for Oscar. And uh, once again, you can get those uh, presentations off of my uh, Pastebin site. Um, it, it got a wonderful 
right up in Magpie. As a matter of fact, it was rated a nine of ten for as a uh, you know uh, an extension for the uh, a Raspberry Pi. Let me turn this thing around since you got the video so close, right? So you can see the Raspberry Pi in there. Um, uh, I've got a keyboard attached to it and a mouse, but I really don't need it to run the thing. And then this is a uh, RS-232 port for it as well. So I can go ahead and get on the console of it as well. But to make that port work, I had to populate some chips and capacitors up here and then bring in some cabling to, uh, to make that function. Um, so, so get a kit. Heat up a soldering iron. It's all about LEDs and switches on this baby. Uh, like I said, there's about 64 LEDs and there's a lot of switches. And the switches have to go in in a very specific order or they won't toggle up as you would normally have that feel or load down or start down or address up. Um, so um, once again, that Raspberry Pi and SimH can just bring out and physically manifest what it was like to have at your disposal a uh, PDP-11-70. Uh, uh, they can also run other uh, PDP-11 versions, but of course their interfaces were slightly different. So uh, the other thing, uh, there's a couple of hidden commands in here. Uh, these actually push uh, uh, to have extra switches in them. That was not a function of the original PDP-11, but that was something so they could control more information on SimH to load other operating systems and stuff. So in development, um, oh, you haven't got it yet. Uh, drivers are being rip, written right now to emulate paper terminals. So the original terminals didn't have display tubes or anything for characters. It was literally, it looked like a typewriter. A piece of paper would come out. That's a different kind of feel than one that's got a terminal. Backspace isn't backspace. There is no backspace. The carriage doesn't go that way. The carriage only goes this way. It's a physical writing device. So they are working to emulate that and actually uh, get that to work with typewriters and stuff. They're interfacing them to the device. Yeah, they've got a web server running on uh, Unix 2.11 and they also have web servers running I think on RL, RL, RT11 as well. Um, they're, they're writing software for those old operating systems. As a matter of fact, some crazy person actually has one of those web servers on the internet running on the Pi on, that's emulating uh, Unix 2.11. It's very simple, so once again, hopefully the attack surface is light. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. A 36-bit PDP-11 is in the offing. Um, and then this is that video that I showed you earlier. Do y'all have any questions about all this stuff? I know it's uh, a lot to take in uh, to uh, think that somebody crazy enough to go, you know, it's nice to have a virtual machine that emulates these things, but wouldn't it be nice to actually touch the computer the way it was? So, any questions about this or anything? Yes, Omar. True, but it's also exploratory, right? So if you wanted to learn how to write drivers, do you want to learn how to write a video driver that's 64-bit, or do you want to learn how to run, uh, uh, write a paper tape driver that's 16-bit, right? So it's the same kind of concepts, right? But you're going to be doing it in machine language at a much uh, simpler machine than, it w than hopefully you would be doing today. Yeah. And, it wouldn't, and you know what? It's, uh, it's non-explodable. You can't blow it up, and if you do, no one's going to care. You just go back to a previous backup of your pie, and you keep going on. Um, no one cares if you've got blown up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, my driver took out Linux or, or Raspberry Pi uh, or Raspberryan uh, or, or SimH. Fine. Just go to the uh, GitHub, download it all, start over, have a nice day. Uh, so it, as someone that's just learning how to code, what a great experience for someone to code in. And you know what? Uh, it's like teaching kids music. Teaching kids octal wouldn't be a bad plan either, right? Uh, because knowing how to do things other than hex or binary or decimal, to have that other uh, math base in your head gives you a, a, a capability that uh, hopefully gets you where you can think better on your feet uh, because your, things are not so foreign for you for an experience and stuff. Oh, 
Wow, I'm running out of time. Um, I see they're getting ready to pull a hook on me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, absolutely it, it does keep oh yeah so the the, the question is uh, from uh, it's good for a hobbyist point of view but what what do I think about it from a uh, historical perspective that's exactly why I like it um, I when I grew up uh, I was reading magazines in the 70s and this guy was like the the bomb this was like oh my god what a computer it's like racks of supercomputers today would be to, to look at or what other operating systems that are out there um, that they can do this and once again before we we started I talked about it to really emulate the feel of this you also have to have three heaters running and a couple of vacuum cleaners right because you have to get the feel and the sound of what this thing was like right um, and that's about what it would be like it's loud and it would be hot <laughs> so um, I'm running out of time thank you all very much and, and y'all have a great rest of the B-Side San Antonio. Thank you, Paul. So it's a